This is the Gauntlet Podcast, Episode 5, The Air Buds of Science Fiction and Fantasy Role-Playing. My name is Jason. This is Derek. My name is Dan. Awesome. Derek, you're joining us uh, for the first time on the cast. Why don't you get started on what you've been playing recently? So last week, I only really played one game, and that was the Monster Hearts campaign that we've been running for the past five weeks, I think it is now. Yeah, I think we did four total sessions uh, of a planned yeah. five. Yeah, we had to we had to we had to skip one of them because of some uh, logistical issues. But we got to play Cheat Your Own Adventure, which was awesome. So right. nice little benefit. Well, what did you think about Monster Hearts? So I, I, I really enjoyed the game. Uh, I played it a couple times before. This was the wrap up, obviously, and everything really came to a head quite nicely, like Monster Hearts generally does. Does, right, yeah. It's built for that. We didn't actually follow the rules to the point where once one player gets their fifth advance, that's the penultimate session of the right, wrap up. Yeah, but yeah. Right. The storylines all came to a logical conclusion and Well and that's that's kind of a that's just a, a side effect of kind of how we organize games, right? right? We we can't always because we have a real strict calendaring system, we can't always like anticipate like when when we'll be able to like do the penultimate session, right? Right. But, right. Um, but I think we, we we had a great story. It ended really nicely and it like you said, in that nice like crescendo that Monster Hearts tends to end in right like like with crazy batshit stuff happening so um. yeah and i feel like you can't really anticipate when that's going to happen right so yeah yeah, if, yeah if you're like trying to play till you get your fifth advance or whatever i think that's not even necessarily the way to get the best story I, everybody kind of knows when it's done i don't think we've ever played any of the campaigns i was in out to when we were supposed to stop yeah i've been thinking a lot about what you've been talking about lately on the cast dan about how dissatisfying levels and advancement are in some of the tra- traditional pbta games And I'm starting to come around on this because you're right. Like, it seemed like we were telling a great story with just the initial two or three moves that each character had. It didn't feel necessary to, like, go beyond that to me. I don't know. I thought it was – it almost felt like a distraction in a way. You know, the chase for experience points was kind of like – it just felt, like, weird and awkward. Yeah. Though I guess if going in, you know that you're playing X number of sessions and it doesn't matter as much. That's true. Yeah, that's fair. Or you're not, like, racing other people, I guess. Right, yeah. Nobody else is going to end the story before right, you're ready yeah, or anything. Yeah. You know, so like we, this may all get cut, but I am coming around to your uh, point of view on this, though, Dan. This is to guarantee it doesn't. I'll get leave cut. it in. If you're <laughs> yeah, with this, me. this is yeah. to guarantee it doesn't get cut. I'm I'm coming around on your point of view on experience, Dan, because it occurred to me that one of the things I don't like when I'm GMing a game is when there's experience at stake, like experience points, like rewards. I feel like somewhat tied to that. Like I have to give the the characters X number of chances to make XP, right? And if I'm not giving everyone an equal like amount of time or attempts to do that, like that's always kind of bugged me in role playing games. And so I don't know. I'm kind of coming around on this. Like, do we need it? Eh, I don't know. I'm Great. Not, we'll, we'll see. Um, well, Dan, what have you been playing recently? So the only other thing besides Monster Hearts was we played a game of One Last Job. Uh, yes. Uh, would you like to set that one up just to sure. people? So know what it is. this is kind of the classic story of ex washed up criminals getting together to pull like the one last job that's going to set them up for the rest of their lives and get them out of the game and all right, that. Right. Yeah. So it's written by Grant Howitt, who has written a ton of games. Uh, I think it was his third game that month, as I recall. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was <laughs> when he was hitting, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, he was hitting was, Patreon really hard. Yeah. One last job was like number three of five that month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so really love everything about it right up until the point where you have to start uh, engaging with the mechanics. <laughs> that seems like a big problem. <laughs> it's on the face of it. Uh, well, what do you mean by that? It starts off with the sort of classic getting the gang back together scene where you're going and uh, recruiting all of the members of the gang and getting them back together and all of that. And that's all just kind of free role play. And it's right. fantastic. It, and is, it is very good. It yeah. really hits the tone of any of the movie's Right. That yeah. Deal with this subject. You know, it's hitting all the right tone. Just in general, it's fantastic. But when you actually get into the mission itself and you're rolling die and trying to figure out what they mean and you're dealing with die pools and like, if I roll a 10, then this happens. But if you roll a one, then this happens. And right. And there's several different like levels of that, right? Like, it's yeah, not, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit surprisingly yeah. fiddly yeah, it's for fiddly. a game that yeah. doesn't need it. I don't think. No, not at all. I agree. Like, so I, I love the setup as well. I was also in that game of, of one last job and the setup is really cool because Essentially what it is is like you have the boss and the boss like says, oh, I've got, you know, he kind of says what the, you kind of say what the job is. And then you say, I need to go get, I need to go get, you know, Frankie Knuckles or whatever, who was a, you know, race car driver or whatever. Right. Right. You get to define like who the next character is in the gang. And then someone volunteers to be that character. And then you have a little scene introducing them. And then that player gets to say, oh, you know who we need for this job? 
character X who does Y, right? And then it's kind of cool because you you could end up with a character that you had not anticipated at all, right? And right, um, and that's it, it's really cool. It's really fun. Very genre appropriate. That's always how those movies go, right? Like the right. little little montage where you're you know getting the gang together. Uh, just way too fiddly. The game doesn't need it. Like the the game is just so fiddly mechanically. Like you could you could strip out like. of the mechanics in that game. Like all the different like little trait things that you can like give to characters for re-rolls. And like there's all the, and like you said, all the the weird die pool stuff and all that. It's just, it's just too much. But otherwise the game really hits the setting and the tone great. Like it's, it's, it's pretty cool. We had, we had a great time with it. I mean, it was still fun, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Was that your list? That's it. Okay. So I was also in the Monster Hearts game, obviously, and uh, one last job. I also played a grim world like we've been doing on Fridays. I don't have a lot to say about it, except that, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we did something kind of unusual for a dungeon world game in that the whole session was the characters trying to break the siege of a fortress. It was not like a dungeon crawl. It was more of like, you know, engaging in sorties and like trying to get behind the enemy and like, um, uh, do things to sort of like sabotage these invaders. Like, uh, it was kind of a neat thing, uh, that uh, sort of, just a kind of a setup I've never really done in Dungeon, dungeon World. So it was, it, it worked really well. I, I was pretty happy with it. And then the only other thing I did besides Grim World was <laughs> we made, we made Burning Wheel characters on Thursday. Um, I, we, we did not play the Pathfinder card game like we normally do. I think so I'm that's, really sad that we're not getting the weekly Pathfinder card no, game. Yeah, the, the, the that's Pathfinder, been a staple the, of the podcast. It, it has been the Pathfinder Adventure card game update. No, no, I've, I've completed my character arc on that. Uh, it's over. I'm done with it. We did Burning Wheel characters. I don't know why, because I don't think we're going to play Burning Wheel. Uh, it was torturous. Like sitting around making all these characters <laughs> was just pure torture. Uh, it took, it took hours. There's, there's a worksheet. And you like do everything on the worksheet and then you have to transfer everything over to the, uh, to the character sheet. Um, a la doing taxes. It's a little, you know, it's very complex. Now here's the thing. I like making characters in Burning Wheel, like by myself. Like it's really fun. Like I can sit down with that book and just do it and make some characters in Burning Wheel. It's, it's a, it's a fun process. Not with four people. <laughs> we, right. And we even had multiple copies of the book and it was still really cumbersome and time consuming. It took us about four hours to not even finish. Like I think we still have a good hour or two to go. So. Yeah, I don't know why we did it. Just the only thing I can think of is like, why did why did I put the the guys through this? Is just I don't know. Like acts of love feel so much better when they're tempered with little bursts of punishment. That's, <laughs> that's the only thing I can come up with. So it was an act of love uh, putting them through that torturous experience. But that's all I've got. Uh, why don't we take a break and we'll go to the next segment? So our next segment is, uh, as always, is giving me life. Uh, this is a chance for us to talk about things that are not role playing games. So, Dan, what's giving you life this week? So what's giving me life this week is uh, a website, I guess. That that sounds real bad. Like, this oh. website is giving me life, right? But, <laughs> um, anyway, it's a website. It's been running for a while. It's by a guy named uh, John Koenig, and it's called The Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. So for a long time, it was just a website where this guy makes up words <laughs> and gives them really, like, evocative and interesting definitions for like common things about like being a human and right, like, the yeah. human experience. Right. Some of the examples are like, I think one of them is Sonder, which is the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own. And that you may just be like an extra who shows up in one scene of their lives. And right. All of this, right. <laughs> and so it's like just that super is sad. That's sad. It's, yeah. Well, it's kind of sad, right? But it's kind yeah. of, I mean, it's, got like the melancholy aspect right, yeah. where like it's it's sort of sad but it, i don't know it's kind of inspiring right because it's right, yeah. something that we all experience <laughs> so but anyway he started making little short movies for each of these words and so uh just everything about them is great like the production values are amazing he narrates them uh his voice is fantastic perfectly suited to it just the cinematography everything is amazing like one of the videos is for a word called oh now i get to try to pronounce this Vemodalen. It's got an umlaut, so I'm not entirely sure if I'm pronouncing I'm that correctly. I'm not sure either. Yeah, I just do great German accents. I don't actually know. German, <laughs> so, yeah. so that he has defined as uh, the fear that everything's already been done, and so the video is just like three minutes of him sort of monologuing about this, while every frame of the video is a Flickr photo taken by a different photographer, all showing similar scenes. And so it just flashes through uh, like hundreds okay. of photos yeah, that yeah. have been taken by individual people that all like show the same thing, essentially. 
And I don't know, just anytime I watch these things, I have to like set aside five minutes and be like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to get in the, get in the, the, uh, in the mode here. Dictionary of Obscure yeah. Sorrows mode and just absorb <laughs> this. And so it's giving me life. I, uh, you introduced me to that website about a year ago. And at that time, there weren't videos. It was just, no, um, the videos are a new thing. Yeah. It was yeah. just like entries, but there was one, I don't remember the word, what, what, what the word was, but I loved it. It was, um, the definition of it, the sorrow, so to speak, was, the idea that you walk into like a library or a bookstore and knowing that there's no way you can possibly read all of those books. Right. Right. <laughs> like, like that is the, that is, and I've experienced that, right? Like, you, right. you know, and I don't even like to read. Reading is for chumps. Sorry for those who read. Um, I'll, I'll just watch the movie, but, <laughs> but, 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 but no, like it's very, you know, like I, I loved it. I just, yeah, it's just pretty cool. No, that's, that's, that's a good one. I like so yeah, that. dictionary of obscure sorrows.com or search on YouTube and watch the videos. They're amazing. Sweet. Awesome. Derek, what's giving you life this week? Well, it's actually been a couple of weeks that this has been giving me life, but, uh, it's board games on Steam. And the reason why this is giving me life is uh, there are a couple board games that my friends and I, we get together every two or three weeks and we play board games. Sure. But sometimes they don't want to play a particular board game that I'm really into or it just it's too fiddly or too complicated. I know that it's not the right audience for them. Right, yeah. And so recently, um, a couple games, namely Sentinels of the Multiverse and The Witcher... Uh, the Witcher board game, not the Witcher video game, right, yeah. have been released on Steam. And yeah. now if I ever want to get a quick fix of either of those, I can just jump on Steam and go ahead and play 20 minutes or an hour or just kill however much time I have. So you just play with, like, random dirt bags online? Uh, actually, you can play, <laughs> you can play single player. Yes, his friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you can play either single player or you, hot seat. So okay. sometimes like right. my yeah. girlfriend, but you can also play with like, um, AI. Okay. All so. right. But you're not playing with random dirt. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, video game board games are one of the coolest things to happen in like the last five or six years, in my opinion, because the listeners don't know this about me, but my family, we're, we're a board gaming family, right? Like that's what we do on the holidays. We play board games and, um, but when we're not together, we're all on our iPads or iPhones and we have like Carcassonne going, we have Ticket to Ride going, Agricola, which I know Dan loves. Um, <laughs> we, we have we got all those games going and, uh, it's, it's cool. I like it a lot. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Another shout out for Steam on the, uh, things giving us life. It's true. It's, yeah. And uh, Steam gets a lot of love over here. Cool. Is there anything what you want to say about it or uh that's pretty much it i think right, cool. well awesome so the thing giving me life okay so as a general matter i'm given life by whenever science fiction or like weird fantasy or horror whenever those things like whenever the veil between those things and reality is pierced slightly or or, or the line <laughs> is blurred a little bit i love that like that let me give you an example of what i mean do you guys remember a few years ago when there were those bath salt zombies? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. So, like, there were these people who were taking bath salts, and they were going crazy, and they were, like, eating people's faces, right? <laughs> like, like, that was a thing. Now, like you do in Miami when you're bored. <laughs> well, yeah, no, yeah. I'm, I'm sure worse things happen in Florida as a general matter. So, really horrifying story, right? Like, really, the, the story was gross. It was really terrible, really, really depressing. I think it was, like, homeless people who were attacked. It was really bad. But... A little part of me was really, really excited by that because all I could think was, this is so fucking awesome. There are, there are drug fueled face eating zombies in the world I live in. How fucking <laughs> awesome is that? Right. It's so cool. Um, another thing, satanic cults. That's never been a real thing. Like this idea of like devil worshiping cults. That's all bullshit. But. Every now and then you hear a news story where like maybe there was a devil worshiping cult doing a thing, you know, like it might have been a thing that was, you know, maybe, maybe devil you know, cult activity was involved. I get so excited by that because I love the idea of living in a world where there actually are like devil worshiping cults, like in bad horror movies of the seventies, right? Love that stuff. So the thing, the specific thing giving me life this week, there is this product, uh, called Soylent. Uh, it was kickstarted a couple years ago. If I'm getting this wrong, Dan, let me know. Cause I think Dan, you've actually consumed soy lunch right? i have yeah, yeah yeah uh so it's this it's basically just like a meal replacement shake <laughs> i mean that's a pretty good uh, well i mean i guess it's it's really like a lifestyle paradigm shifting product <laughs> indeed, right? indeed. so it's this uh it's this meal replacement shake it gives you all of your all of your nutritional things you need you can just drink soy lunch and never have to eat food again right it was very popular there's a huge demand for it a lot of people want it the guy who's in charge of the company the ceo okay have you ever, like, when you read dystopian fiction, it's a thing where, like, there was some crazy visionary scientist guy who had, like, some amazing idea for improving the, the condition of mankind, right? And, and it always, like, ends up being totally fucked and the world is just, is just screwed over, right? Like, right. Like, like the apes take over or whatever, right? It's always that kind of thing. 
this guy is, lives among us right now. He is the CEO of Soylent. His name is Rob Reinhardt. He is one of these crazy people who, if we follow him, he's going to bring us to a future where we all want to kill ourselves. I mean, or, or, we, or we just want to take Soma and check out for the remainder of, of our lives. Like, that is it, right? So he wrote this manifesto. I want to read just a couple little sentences from it because um, it, it's just amazing that, like, a, a human wrote this. Um, I love that it's a manifesto. It is. It is. It's a manifesto. I'm yeah. pretty sure it was a blog post, but. No, no, no. no. I'm pretty sure he called it a manifesto, didn't he? Did he not? I, I don't think so. I think you're just, I think you're reading a little bit into this. Don't, don't defend this guy, Dan. He's <laughs> crazy. Blog, blog posts are kind of the manifestos at the 2010. It's I guess like, that's yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. The Unabomber would totally be blogging about all this crazy <laughs> shit if, he, if that was a thing. All right. So now I like to read this to myself, like imagining that it's being spoken by like the villain in the first Bioshock video game. You, know, you, you guys know what I'm talking <laughs> yeah, about? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. I built a city. Where the artist does not have to fear the censor, right? You guys know that. Right, right? yeah, yeah. But maybe don't read it like that. I won't, no, I won't won't read that. But, um, so here we go. This, these are, these are things that a man, a CEO of a company who was just given millions and millions of dollars in angel investment funding, uh, these are things he wrote. He wrote, three years ago, I drove across the nation because I was looking for something. I wanted to join a community of benevolent technologists laboring for the betterment of society at large. Love that. Yep. Right? Yep. So good. I'm, I'm with him. I'm right there. Yeah. <laughs> can like can I hitch a ride? I mean, yeah, right, yeah, I'm yeah, in. Yeah. I'm in. <laughs> um, two years ago, I'm, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I'm not reading the whole thing. Two years ago today, I decided to bet my life on the idea that food could be empirically rebuilt. I theorized that food and the body were reducible, and a novel foodstuff could be superior to that which was naturally occurring. Three months of Soylent produced a remarkably healthy physiology and continues to do so years out. No one talks like this. This man is crazy. <laughs> He's so crazy. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Uh, I like this one. The future of food is not the return to an agrarian society, but the transcendence of it. In time, Soylent will be synthesized directly from light, water, and air with designer microorganisms, genetic engineering to enhance our microbiome and eventually ourselves. I don't know who was the first farmer, but I want to be the last. We will make food so cheap that only the rich will cook. Crazy. I, I love it. It is so... It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. I'm <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah. This guy is nuts and I love him. Uh, he's giving me life. You, Rob Reinhardt, ripped straight out of the pages of, of, of sci-fi magazines. You're amazing and you're giving me life. It's so cool. Um, fantastic. Awesome. So our main topic today is <laughs> the air buds of science fiction and fantasy <laughs> role playing games. Uh, so last week on the Gauntlet Grump cast, uh, we were, our, our topic was old yellers, which is mechanical conventions and role playing games we want to, we want to take out back and kill. We're, we're, we're going in the other direction, uh, specifically related to, to science fiction and fantasy games. Listeners don't have to be told that these are like the most common genres uh, in role playing. And, uh, what I wanted to talk about for this topic was, We've each selected three games uh, a piece that we think represent like a really unique take on science fiction and fantasy. Uh, that uniqueness can come from either uh, a mechanical uniqueness, like it does a cool mechanical thing, or something about the setting or the theme or the tone is is particularly unique uh, vis-a-vis your standard science fiction and fantasy games. And so, uh, or or both, right? Sure. So uh, let's just get started. Dan, what's the first game on your list? What is your so, first Air Bud? My first Air Bud, which... As we all know, is the opposite of Old Yeller. Uh, cl- the, <laughs> right. the direct and total opposite of Old Yeller. Right, yeah. yeah I think yeah. that was on the SAT. Yeah. Actually. And a bit of, and a bit of sci-fi himself, because he's like a dog that can jump and do baskets, right? That's so, true. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That was terrible. Go. <laughs> so, my first Air Bud is Lacuna Part 1, the creation of the mystery and the girl from Blue City. Which not only has the best title of any role playing game. I love a game with a really long title. The best. Oh yeah, yeah. And especially things like where they start with like Lacuna Part One. There is no Part Two. <laughs> there will never <laughs> be a Part Two. <laughs> but uh, of course, it's called Part One. So anyway, this is by Jared Sorensen, and it's sort of a Inception-y type setting where people like their dreams all come from this one place called blue city. And it's like the collective unconsciousness of humanity. And so uh, when you go to sleep, like you end up there, but they figured out how to just directly insert people into it. And they go there to track down criminals and kill the bad part of them that lives in the dream world that controls them and makes them evil. Hmm. So the whole setting is like the whole story is your characters are all inside this dream world, which means that, uh, in addition to being just a cool setting in general, all of the mechanics 
function off of kind of like dream weirdness. Right. And so uh, you don't have health or anything, but you have a heart rate. Right. And so as you're playing, your heart rate goes up. Anytime you do things, your heart rate goes up. And like every character has like a target heart rate where if they're in that zone, they're better. But then when they get above it too high, then they'll have to like get ejected from the dream or they'll die or whatever. Right. Right. So it's tracking your heart rate the whole time, which is really cool. And uh, there's also this concept of static where because you're not supposed to actually be in the dream world unless you're sleeping, when you do things that are disruptive to the world, the static increases, which increases like the weird surrealness of the setting. Right. So just really weird things start to happen more and more as the static goes up, and, like the longer you stay in and just everything about it, like the way the rule book is written because it's written as an incomplete game, quote unquote. And like, right. Uh, yeah. So Jared Sorensen said that it was a game that was never meant to be played, which clearly it was meant to be played. I love a, <laughs> right. I love, I love a stunt rule book with stunt formatting. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And just like the bureaucracy, because you're part of this very opaque bureaucracy. And so your character sheet is a Scantron. I love that. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's so awesome. good. Yeah, yeah. so good. You don't pick anything about your character. Even your character's like code name is assigned to you. And then it, oh. the GM's just like, fill out this name on your Scantron because that's who you are now. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's my favorite character sheet in a role playing game. Uh, just that Scantron thing. It's so, um, yeah, it just really hits home the fact that there's like this heavy bureaucracy, right? Yeah. I remember when I first saw it, I remember thinking, oh man, that is so cool. That is that's really badass. I think the only other game that has a better character sheet is the toe tag character sheet in, um, in, uh, Hollow Point. Hollow Point. Yeah. 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 Your oh. character sheet's a toe tag, right? Which is, which is kind of, which badass. is actually just a fan made character sheet. That's oh, not, that's not the official character oh, sheet. Oh, yeah. what a bummer. Yeah, yeah. They should, they should get that because it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I like Lacuna a lot. I've played it a couple times. Uh, I really dig it. You're right. The inception comparison is apt. Um, in, in the sense that you're like this team of people trying to like go into this guy's, you know, like, or this, this network consciousness or whatever. Right. And, and yeah. try to like fix this guy, like yeah. mess with this guy in reality by like disrupting him in the dream world. All of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty badass. I like it a lot. Cool. Uh, Derek, what's the first game on your list? So the first game on my list is, well, it's actually kind of a cheat game. It's not actually released yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's called uh, Carthoon. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It was kickstarted August, I think, of last year. I think I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, from Brian Patterson and Tracy Barnett. Brian Patterson actually is the artist behind D20 Monkey, And in the course of that comic, he created this world and thought it was kind of cool. And so he decided to kickstart it. Right. Yeah. Um, And so I've been reading the comics. And from what I've read in the comics, it sounds pretty cool. And it it really ties into this whole idea of uh, twists on modern fantasy, which is our topic today. Right. Yeah. Uh, And so the big thing that this does is it's an interesting twist on all the traditional races and monsters. Oh, like the, like when you say traditional, you mean like the Tolkien, like elves and orcs and all that. Elves, gnomes, all all that kind of stuff. So one one of the things, um, and this is something that we've seen in like, um, in, in sorcerer and stuff like that. But, uh, the, the wizards in this setting are tied to Jin and Ifridi. Right. Yeah. And so, but when they die, those beings manifest in the world. And then yeah. that, that's why those beings are meant to like make deals with wizards. That, that kind uh, okay. of gives them the impetus it's like to their, do that. Their little gateway into the world. Or whatever. Exactly. Right, yeah. Um, and I might be misunderstanding this, but that's what I took from the comic. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and right now, there's only been a couple brief little uh, previews. One of the things that was released is their take on elves, where all their elves are shapeshifters of some kind. Okay. Um, so they all belong to different clans. You have either the wolf clan, the bear clan, or the jackal clan. Right. And each of those clans is tied to a different moon. Okay. And then when that moon is in power that clan is in power. Okay. And so it kind of implies this caste system that you see in a lot of traditional fantasy elf, right, elvish yeah. takes with high elves and dark elves right, and stuff yeah. like that. Thranduil and, and all of his people. Exactly. Right, yeah. uh, but it also puts a twist on it where there are feral beings and, you know, at least this is the direction I hope they take the book in. <laughs> and, you know, once a month they, they give in more to their animal needs instead of being these high cerebral beings that a lot right, of traditional yeah, ones are. Yeah. So so this is more of a hopefully this provides some really good twists on traditional fantasy tropes. Cool. Um what well, so how do they I'm curious, um how do they handle orcs? And and is this related to wicked fantasy in any way? Okay. Am I am I mixing things up here or um you you are not. Wicked fantasy it was if I remember correctly, it was created by John Wick. Right. Right, yeah. And it's written for Pathfinder specifically. 
I'm sure, yeah. Uh, whereas Carthoon is supposed to be system agnostic. It's okay. just a setting book. Right. And Wicked Fantasy is a similar idea where John Wick was putting new twists on human races and orcs and things like that. Right, yeah. Um, I actually don't have Wicked Fantasy and haven't looked through it. I'm just familiar with what I've read about it online. Sure, sure. Specifically for your orcs question, that preview has not been made available, so I don't know what their take on orcs. Oh, okay. uh, it's All pretty right. much just elves has been released and then the stuff that you can glean from their um, cool. from the comic. Yeah, I think, um, I know, Dan, this is one of the things, the issues I know you have with fantasy games is like, they just keep rehashing like the traditional races in the same way. And That's true. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, what are your thoughts on it then? I'd be curious to get your take on, on uh, this. So that sounds better. I don't know. I still have a, I have an issue. I think we discovered what my issue actually was. I think it's the first time I actually like managed to articulate what my issue with fantasy is, is that uh, I just can't take any of it seriously. So. I don't know that this would, I don't know if this would be better or not, but you know, I don't know. I'd play it. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, all right. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'll check that out. I don't know much about it, but is there a connection with Wicked, Sa- Wicked no, Fantasy? No, there's, there's not. Okay. I yeah, thought there are I two. I, Cause I know Wicked Fantasy does some interesting things with the standard right. fantasy tropes, right? The, the only thing I'm really aware of with Wicked Fantasy, I mean, it's supposed to do interesting things with different, uh, yeah. with humans and everything. The only thing I'm really aware of on Wicked Fantasy, the only explicit example I know of is, um, the halflings, I believe, are, uh, they're not like your regular jovial chefs. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Living in the shadow of man, baking bread. Right. right exactly. <laughs> like, they're, and um, dancing for coin on the table. Right. I yeah. think there's some kind of assassins or something. Uh, like, I can't yeah, remember yeah, the details yeah. of it, but yeah. Rimworld does a thing with halflings like that where they're like, um, so like the idea is that halflings are like supremely adaptable, right? Like, so when in a, in a world filled with men and bigger races, they adapt to like live in their shadow and kind of like, uh, you know, kind of symbiotically live with, live with them. But in a world where like all that stuff is gone and it's like where civilization is destroyed and they have to like, you know, kind of like get by and like where, where it's all about like how much power you can seize. The halflings that are left have become like, they're all about power and like holding on to power and like using whatever power they can muster to like, you know, punish their enemies. The idea being that like halflings are, are even more adaptable than men, right? Like they're able to adapt in, in all these circumstances. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting, yeah. I don't know, meditation on halflings, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> um, and who doesn't want they? <laughs> no, no, exactly. Um, cool. Well, the first game on my list is uh, one that we've talked about before in our episode one, when we're talking about the games we were looking forward to in 2015. Uh, it is called The Clay That Woke by Paul Sega. I think that's the correct way of saying his name. I don't know. I'm going to say Paul Sega this time in this episode. Uh, <laughs> I think I was saying Sieg last time. He's, I'm going to say Paul Sega now. So last time I, I, I had recommended the game just strictly based off of just off the fact that Paul Sega uh, designed it because I'm really I'm really into Bacchanal and, and My Life with Master, right? Like I like those games. And so I've, since then, though, I've had a chance to actually read through some of the book. I'm about three quarters of the way through it. It's an Air Bud, uh, which is to say it's unique because it it looks like it's mechanically unique. I have not played it yet. And so I don't want to talk about the mechanics too much just because I don't I, I tend to not want to do that when I haven't actually played a game um, but it uses like this token system and all these tokens represent different traits of the characters plus some of the GM traits and you kind of bid tokens and you draw from this it's called the crater of lots and you interpret the tokens like the way you interpret the tokens like dictates how you're supposed to interpret the resolution of the scene right um, that's kind of all I know about it if I'm being honest like it, I'm a little concerned that perhaps it might be um, one of those mechanics that yanks you out of the fiction for too long I'm not sure uh, it's, I, but, but again, I haven't played it, so I don't want to pass any judgment. The reason why I'm including it on my list is because the setting is so cool. It is a fantasy setting, but it's really, it's really unique. Now, it might just be unique to me because I don't read. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and so to me, fantasy just means elves and dwarves and, and drow and, and du- anything in Dungeons and Dragons. Like, that's it for me, right? Like, I don't, I don't read. So, <laughs> so there might be amazing takes on, 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 like, similar to this take on, on a fantasy setting, and, and I'm not aware of it, but, uh, but it's really cool to me and unique. So here's the deal. In the clay that woke, the history of this world is that they found these four baby minotaurs, all male, in the mud of this river. Okay, and the humans of were this, they made out of mud? No, they were just in the mud. Oh damn! Right, that, yeah. I was so real close a, about what the name. You, you were, you but, were very yeah, close. Okay. Yeah, last on episode one when you said that, like, were they made of clay? No, they were not made of clay. I think the I think the clay is kind of a metaphor. I'm not sure. Well, I thought it was like a biblical thing, right? Like they breathed life into the clay and made the minutes. Oh, uh, oh, I see. Yeah, no. Uh, well, no, they found them in 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 mud. Okay. Uh, so, and I'm not even 100 percent sure that's still what that means. I think it is. I think that's what 
the clay that Woke refers to. Uh, so they found these four baby minotaurs. They're all male. And and these four baby minotaurs were raised in this, like, city, this, like, sort of decrepit uh, city of filled with humans that is, um, it's kind of like a Bronze Age, uh, like, jungle sort of like city like think like um like machu picchu or something like that right sure um anyway these four minotaurs were raised and they didn't they didn't fit in well with society because they're fucking minotaurs uh but they never <laughs> but 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 nevertheless like further generations of these minotaurs and ask me later how they reproduce since they were only males um <laughs> further generations of these minotaurs they uh these minotaurs have developed this way of essentially fitting in with uh with this society that kind of views looks down upon them uh so they're in, they're they're integrated into this society into this city but they are put to doing menial tasks or like gladiatorial contests or like just entertainers or like laborers or whatever right security they they do like sort of like the the what are considered the lesser tasks right so the minotaurs have this concept called silence uh which is what makes the characters really cool to play the aspects of like what they call their silence, what it entails is they are c- contemplative. They are to stay contemplative. Uh, is that how you say contemplative? Am I saying that right? That Con- contemplative. Contemplative. Uh, contemplative. Is it contemplative? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, machinations, machinations. I don't know. Exactly. Um, they are, they, they are, are con- to think a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They are to be contemplative. They are to not want for things. They are not to use the names of women. They are not to express their emotions. And the reason why they don't do these things is because to do so causes them to have desire. And when they start to have desire, their, their sort of like animal instincts kick in and they are not able to control themselves. Right. So in play, your characters are, you're, you're, you're going about your business, but things are going to happen in which the GM like thinks or, or someone else at the table believes that you're, you're breaking silence. Right. And the more you break silence, the more greater chance of you like basically having a meltdown. And when you have a meltdown, you like, you, you go charging through the city, possibly knocking over and goring people or whatever. It's a big bad situation. And you run to the jungle. This city, this, this decrepit city is surrounded by this jungle. And this jungle is like this really interesting, like almost like this alien like sentience, right? Like it's filled with, like it seems to have a life of its own. It shifts, it moves, it's constantly growing. And, and there's no indication that there's any other like human society anywhere. Like this city is like the only thing that anyone knows about. There's just this like amorphous jungle. And so the minotaurs run into the jungle. They spend some time in the jungle fighting monsters and, uh, having encounters in the jungle and like, and, and, and this process like gets their animalness out of them or it kind of like restores them, uh, so that they can then, go back and reincorporate into the city as like these like sentry like like uh characters it's it's so it's, is that is that all hand waved or do you actually do that in the game you do that in the game yeah like and that's and so that's that's one of them like when you when you run into the jungle like you know the gm will have prepared like some sort of jungle encounters or whatever you know okay. that, that you have to you know kind of contend with or whatever and as you as you do those things you get back the tokens that represent your silence right huh. um and so then you can go back into the city the, the the book is very interesting it's written kind of like a novella going back to sort of stunt formatting um it's written like a novella with like the rules interspersed um i don't love it just in a like in, in this way and that's kind of hard to find specific rules yeah, right yeah <laughs> but, um but 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 i'm get but i give it a pass because it's a terrific read it's a really really good story that's kind of interspersed in there and it really really like wraps you up in this world one last thing i want to say about it the men of this setting they uh the people who are in this city they are very complex and interesting even maybe more so than the minotaurs because they're a part of this like civilization that they don't like that used to be great but they don't remember it like it's been so long since it's fallen and they're very like simple and superstitious people and so you're supposed to make characters you have you have like this core group of like npcs that are uh presumably human i guess and they they have what paul sega calls um quid pro quo thinking and weird beliefs or like weird beliefs about causality so what that means is these characters are supposed to like like the quid pro quo thinking is they're supposed to be like obsessed with like a self-serving sense of like what they're entitled to right, right. and like and and like and, and and like that's kind of like the kind of people they are and then or they can have like aspects of of weird beliefs of causality which means they they maybe heard a story in their past that makes them think that like oh if we build this road uh that'll stop disease from infecting our children like there's you know like there's there's, right. there's no there's no apparent like connection between those two right. beliefs but like so like all the people in the city are just filled with like these strange like you know like beliefs like and there's an example in the book which i think is terrific basically the idea was that um this guy he believed he saw his doppelganger going into his house over the course of a series of nights 
but he heard a story about like this guy who killed his own doppelganger and it brought him great wealth and power. And so he thought, oh, I need to get this doppelganger who's going into my house and kill him so I can have great wealth and power. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to arrange a situation where my servants and my wife are all arrested and removed from the house for, for good so that it's just the house is empty and I can lie in wait for the doppelganger. And then, <laughs> and then I'll kill him. And I don't know how I'm getting my wife and my servants back, but the wealth and power that I will inevitably get from killing my doppelganger will, will help me figure it out. Right? Like, <laughs> so, okay. So that's, that's super interesting. But if all the PCs are minotaurs, how does stuff like that even become well, so relevant? That, well, because, the, because here's the thing. The, the, I think what, what, I think what he's setting up is like this, this tension between these minotaurs who are very like, they're into like their own like sense of social justice and their own sense of like propriety and like, and, and, and austerity. But they're like subservient or compared to these like people who are kind of like backwards, crazy, okay. crazy hicks, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the thing, right? Yeah. It's like, it's that tension between these, these two cultures or gotcha. whatever. Um, I'm sure there's a metaphor there of some sort that, that he's going for. I don't know what it is, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just really odd and interesting and, and I'm into it. So yeah, the clay that woke. Cool. Okay. So my next air bud of sci-fi, all oh, minor sci-fi. Anyway, my next air bud of sci-fi is. 44, A Game of Automatic Fear, and this is by uh, Matt Snyder, who also did Dust Devils and uh, a few other really interesting looking games. So this one is kind of a different take on sci-fi, just because even though it's sort of a classic sci-fi setting, it's one that you don't see a lot. In uh, In role-playing games. Role-playing games, yeah. yeah. So it's very like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So the idea is that it's the 1950s in America, Cold War is on, and... The PCs have suddenly discovered that someone close to them in their lives has disappeared and been taken over by a robot. Like they're, they have been replaced by a robot who looks exactly like them, but they have like a single tell that the PCs can pick up on that nobody else can. Right. right. And so, uh, it's just, and all of the PCs are kind of encouraged to be just like random dudes. Like we had, you know, a housewife and a kid who worked at the, drugstore or something oh uh, right? well my character was a housewife and, right and we had another kid who worked at like the the, the who's a soda jerk or whatever right, right? Yeah, 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 yeah yeah basic everyday people very 50s tropey characters exactly too. yeah yeah, okay. yeah. No, nothing special about them just people who happen to pick up on the fact that there's this robot conspiracy right where yeah. everyone's okay. being slowly replaced by robots right and so uh over the course of the game they are basically just trying to survive There's not this idea of, like, we're going to save the world or anything. The whole idea is just, maybe I can make it through this and not get replaced by a robot. And I don't know. I thought it played really well. It has, like, a kind of ticking down panic. And all the PCs have people who are, like, set up as their relationships. But as their relationships sort of get damaged when they bring them into play, if they get damaged, then those people turn into robots and right. so they're replaced oh, okay. by robots and they switch over to the GM side of the table. Right. And then yeah. they're like the agents of the GM from that point forward. And it also even has mechanics for PCs to be taken over. And then they just work with the GM. Right. Yeah. To, cool. to take try and catch down. the rest of the characters yeah. and turn them into robots. So. Yeah, we, um, we played it, uh, I don't know, six months ago or something like that. And that was the game that you ran for us. And I really liked it because. I got to play a character that I don't normally get to play, right? Like this, like I think I played like that housewife character, um, who was kind of having like a lot of trouble in her marriage, like the, the classic, like from, you know, like, like cloistered fifties housewife who has to, you know, go to therapy and take pills, you right? Know, right. Yeah. Like, like it was that character and, 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 and no one in her life would believe her about the robots. They were like, Oh, it's just, it's just your emotions, you Have know, you like, taking your pills yeah, today. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 take, yeah. take a pill. Right. Yeah. It was that kind of thing. And, uh, I really dug it. I thought it was good. I don't remember much about it mechanically, but I, um, um, I, I, rem- I remember enjoying the game uh, a lot. And it was, it was, you're right. It was very unique. It was a different sort of, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. And I think it does, experience. it does let you do like interesting characters. And the story is very tightly focused in on like how these particular characters deal with this situation. Right. And not about, you know, the broader conspiracy. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, I haven't played the game, but I really like the idea that. It's not about, you know, badass soldiers going out and killing all the robots exactly. and saving right. the day. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. 
That's its airbudness. <laughs> it is, yeah. That, that's what makes it an airbud. Air bud, which, oh my god, we keep saying this over and over again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I hope we don't change the name. Even though it's completely <laughs> stupid. Um, yeah, no, no, you're right. No, it's really cool. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, Derek, what's your next uh, guy on the list? So the next one for me, I'm probably going to regret putting it on there because I can't pronounce the author's name. Ah, <laughs> uh, um, yes, we we've had that trouble. Right. <laughs> um, but it's uh, Archipelago. Right. By Mathis? I think it's Matisse. Matisse? All right. Matisse Holter. Holter. Yeah, I think that's right. There's an H in there, and so and as an American, there's, a J. I there's like a silent J. Yeah. Yeah, there's like, yeah, there's a lot going on there. So, um, uh, just to clarify, Ar- Archipelago 3, right? Archipelago 3. Right, Archipelago yes. 3. Um, okay. I, I don't think I've played any of the other Archipelagos. We've uh, just done Love in the Time of Seath. Uh, right, it was just good. Archipelago 2. It's Archipelago basically. 2, right. right? Not as good as 3, in my opinion, but it was fun. But yeah. um, So, right off the bat, this... It's a game system that really has no baked in setting. So it right. can be sci-fi, it can be fantasy, it can be whatever you want. Right. Which is, it's always nice to have a generic system like that. Uh, but a lot of generic systems end up being like GURPS or Heroes and very being rules very heavy. crunchy right. yeah, and crunchy. rules heavy. Yeah. Uh, so this one's actually very light, and it does one of the things that I believe, Jason, you were talking about in the last podcast, where it doesn't have a GM. It uh, does not. No, it's it completely GM free. Yeah. And so it kind of distributes the responsibility of the GM and creating the setting mm-hmm. amongst all the players. And it does this really cool thing where each player is responsible for a specific setting aspect. Right. And then whenever someone interacts, interacts with that setting aspect, they have veto power. They Can we have an example of like what that would be like? Just so, so people understand it better. Right. So for example, um, if I'm in charge of the magic set setting and then Jason is talking about how his wizard uses Vancy in magic, I can be right. like, no, there's no Vancy in no magic. Vancy in magic. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. not how this works. Yeah. 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 Um, or like in a sci-fi setting, you might have like one of your your, your things might be like space travel, like right. like someone's in charge of that element. Like, right. what does that mean, space yeah. travel? Do you like, do faster than light? Is it all so, right. so you yeah. know that kind of stuff? Are there worms floating in a miasma of spice that, <laughs> that fold space and teleport you there? But it's also like cultural <laughs> things too. So it's not even just because that those were both examples right. of like kind of physics, right? And like yeah. how the world works. But it, it could also be like you know you're I'm in charge of the government. And so right, yeah. I could say, you know, if you're interacting with the government, I could say, no, that's just not how the government works. Right. right? Yeah. Or, you know, even more abstract than that. So the point of these setting aspects is that these are elements that are really important to the story you're telling. Right. And so you, if something that's really important to the story is the geography, you right. can have someone in charge of the geography and right. say, right. Yeah. no, there's not a river there. Or yes, there is. Like you can be as abstract with these aspects yeah. as you want. Well, and ultimately the whole point of it, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, um, is to create like a consistency in the narrative, right? Exactly. Like that's that's the right. the big part of it, right? Or one of, uh, especially the with goal. distributed GMing, right, where yeah. you don't have one person writing out a in scenario, of all of it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the, the other thing I really like about it is a lot of a lot of especially fantasy games. I feel end up being all right. You assemble this group of adventurers and you go out and you just kind of you're either in a sandbox and you just wander around aimlessly right or you know you're following the plot railroad right yeah well what this what archipelago 3 does is each character is given at the beginning of the game a destiny point right and they have to achieve that destiny point at some point in that session right and so if you play multiple sessions you can have the same character have multiple destiny points and they kind of change but it gives a sense of each character has a story arc of a beginning, right, middle, yeah, and end. Yeah. They're always pushing towards something. Right. Within a session, even. Not like Monster Hearts. You know, it generally takes several sessions to resolve to get to the, the arc, story. Sure. Yeah. But here, every session, every character has some kind of arc. Well, and the cool thing about the Destiny thing is, um, am I, tell me if I'm remembering this right. But as I recall, we've played it a fair amount. It's been a little while. Everyone else at the table writes a proposed destiny for your right. character, right? And you pass it around. And then the character who, um, again, going back to your idea of like no control over your character, Dan, and, right. like, and why that's a, that, why that can be a cool thing. Um, you then get all your little proposed destinies from the other players back and you just choose the one you like best, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and it, it's neat. Yeah. It's, and it's kind of like a nice, it's kind of like a, uh, it's like a halfway between like having, character agency but also giving up some control of the table and um right that that's always really fun it's kind of neat to see what other people come up with and, and yeah it's pretty cool yeah so, so a couple of the other things that archipelago does differently than other games are it has these ritual phrases that right, any yeah. player can use pretty much at any time the one that i think is kind of the biggest 
contribution is uh, try another way. Yeah, right. try a different yeah, way. Yeah, that's a good one. Which yeah. is amazing because it gives you permission to tell somebody else, no, that's not where, that's, I don't like the story going there. Right, so, yeah, like, try, try another way. Else. And, and, they right. can, and they can't, like, object. Like, right. they have to try another way, yes. right? Yeah. Right. It's codified like it's kind of a codified uh I don't know, like it gives you permission to to do a thing that you might feel uncomfortable doing otherwise. Like, right, yeah. Because in most games in you're not gonna be rules, like, Yeah, that right. was dumb. Don't do that. <laughs> right, yeah. And it, it kind of softens it a little, right? Because <laughs> right. you're not actually just saying, Hey, that was dumb. <laughs> right. Like there are mechanics in place to be like, Well, I just didn't really like the way that leads that is leading the story. So yeah, maybe we should try yeah. something else. Yeah. Right. Um, the other ones are describe that in detail, which is great. It's a know? very good one. Yeah. It, I like that one a lot. It's, it's, very, um, it's, there are some players who have a tendency to just quickly third person narrate like what their character's doing. Right. Or, or to like just say, Oh, I walk into the temple and you get to say, describe that in detail, which means they have to give you some, they have to tell you like what that temple looks like and what their character's thinking and all that stuff. Right. Exactly. It's good, good stuff. Um, I'd like an interlude, which, yeah, we didn't really use a whole lot, I don't think, but um, it has its uses. It has, yeah, I've used it. It's the idea is essentially that you know when you're not the star character of the of the scene, like your spotlight time rotates around the table, right? But if you want, if there's something that you think would be interesting, like a little tiny quick scene, like before it gets to your turn, you can say, "Hey, I'd like an interlude just to just to kind of wrap tie up an end, or right, you know, or like foreshadow thing. what you're going to be doing in your exactly, scene." Foreshadow exactly, right? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. It's got right. its uses. It's 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 a it's a good narrative tool. I think. Yeah, it, yeah, it's great. Um, I just haven't seen it used. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, as yeah. much as the other ones. Yeah. Um, the the other one that I really like is harder. Where someone does yeah. something and you're like, you know what? It, it's similar to the try a different way, but instead of, you know, no, I don't like that. Let's go a different direction. It's more, hey, I really like this path. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper into right. it. More into, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and so one of the funny things about these ritual phrases is, I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off, Derek. Oh. I'm sorry, but one of the things I like about them is, We've actually incorporated these phrases like into just our general role playing, right? Yeah. Like yeah. we, we do, right? Like I say harder all the time, you know, yeah. I say, I say try another way all the time, you know, even though yeah. they're not, it's not in the rules of those games. Like, everyone <laughs> knows what it means and they obey it, right? Like right, they, yeah. when anyone says it, they're like, Oh yeah, okay, I'll do it, you know, cause it's, it's become kind of like a social contract thing almost, yeah, which yeah. is pretty badass, you know. Another great one for, you know, those people who they get thrown a harder or try a different way and they're at a loss is help. Right, helps good. Yeah, which yeah. is good. Which is fantastic, because that's another thing that a lot of games, like, other, in a lot of other games, it really feels like you're on the spot to do, like, when it's your turn, right. like, you are there. And it you're, almost like, feels You're punitive. the one performing, right? Yeah. Whereas, like, this gives you permission to be like, you know, hey, I don't have the best idea right now, so... Does someone else right. have a suggestion? Yeah, yeah, those ritual phrases, now that I think about them, they're really, truly, like, just good role-playing, right? Like, like they good, are. good, like yeah. Good, like, social behavior at the role-playing game table, right? Because we do that, like we're all we're all pretty good role players but but often even as a gm sometimes in a game i'll be like hey someone help me out with this like what does this look like or tell me what's about to happen you know like it's it's nice because it's like you know you don't always have all the answers and i think i think a good role playing game group you know a role a good rpg group will will kind of help each other out and kind of bounce ideas off each other and these ritual phrases really help they really help like you know um when you if you kind of incorporate them into your general role playing they're, they're pretty awesome um, and then the last one, which ties into the conflict resolution, is that might not be quite so easy. Right, yeah. And so this is this is the other thing, the final thing that I'm going to talk about with Archipelago, is the conflict resolution, where when someone brings up this ritual phrase, that might not be quite so easy. They're, they're going to do it with something that maybe you hand-waved over or something that you just kind of skip past, and they're like, hold on a second. You know, th- this is more difficult than right, you think it yeah. is. Like an inflection point. Like when you reach a point where it's like a decision, like you could possibly fail. Right. right. Yeah. 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 We're, we're, well, I think more specifically where failure is an interesting alternative. Oh, that's better. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's phrased better. Yeah. You're right. right. That's good. Yeah. Um, and so what, what happens then is there's a deck of cards and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you either choose someone or if what you're trying to resolve pertains to a setting aspect that person in charge of the setting aspect draws the card and interprets it. Uh, you draw it. the card, you read the card, and the cards are all some version of like, uh, so the, the question. Yes and. Yes or and. Like, do I no but. Yeah, yeah like the question is like, do I say, am I able to grab the golden idol? And so you draw the card and it would be no but, you know, you get this bonus thing or. Well, yes. but the card is just no but 
for the most part, right? And um, then you no, give no, it no. to another character to interpret, and it, they right, say, like, yeah. what the butt actually what means. What it means, yeah. right, yeah. Well, the cards that I have here say, no butt, you earn a friend, alley, or goodwill in the process. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it yeah. kind of tells you a little bit what happens, A little right? bit, yeah. right. But, like, like, the worst one is, like, no and, because that means not only did you fail, but something worse even happened, right? Right, Like, like yeah. so you get the no and, or the, you know, or, or the, but the best one is, like, yes and. Like, yes, right. you succeed, and you get this bonus thing, right? So. Well, and the best part about the no and is that the cards have a little tiny blood stain on yes. them. Yes, right? <laughs> that's yeah. right, yeah. Just yeah. to drive home the point that, that you're, you're screwed. Yeah, you're totally screwed. Um, yeah, so, uh, but no, you give it to another player, and they kind of, like, uh, you know, they kind of interpret the, what it means right. um, for you. Yeah, it's great. Archipelago is really cool. I guess it doesn't have to be. It's not even like necessarily a science fiction or fantasy story you're telling. No, you it's could tell. anything. We've only ever done science fiction and fantasy with it. But I think, uh, as I believe. <laughs> that No, that's not true. Is that not true? When yeah, it, we did it. We did our crime drama thing. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we did our our our, our The Wire, the HBO's The Wire, yeah. uh, on in, in Archipelago, or we you know inspired by that. Um, but no, but yeah, so we can kind of tell any kind of story. It does tend to work well with sci-fi and fantasy though, because the characters have destinies, right? And I think it's easier to. I think I don't know when I think of destiny, I think of like big heroic like world world altering characters almost but that, that's my, my, that's, my I, that's my narrow view <laughs> yeah. i think that uh like one of the cool things about archipelago is that the destinies don't have to be big and world changing i mean it can be something very personal to the character that's true you can tell yeah. very very small personal stories i'm simple it would work. i'm just real simple no. <laughs> I mean, like, like for you know the crime drama you could do something like I, you you will lose your partner to drugs Right. Something right. like that. Yeah. 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 yeah like far from far from world shaking, really. Right. Like, sure, very important sure. to the character. Yeah, fair enough. But fair but enough. I mean the world shaking destinies do tie into the the source material, which is Ursula K. Le Guin's um, uh it's Earth Sea. It's Earth Sea. Earth Sea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the the whole the whole game was inspired by Earth Sea. Um right. and uh, I've never read those because I don't read uh, <laughs> I've, never, I've never read those books. I, I hear they're great. So yeah, no Archipelago, is there anything else you want to say about it or I think that pretty much ties up everything. Cool. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. I would say Archipelago Oh gosh! Um, if anyone cares, I think Archipelago is probably in my top five role playing games. Easy for me good. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's pretty fair. awesome. Well, cool. Um, my next game is called Swords Without Master. Uh, Swords Without Master is by uh, Epidia Ravishal. It is a game that tells a pretty standard uh, swords and sorcery story, if I'm being honest. Uh, it's like pretty straightforward, like Conan, uh, Fawford and the Grey Mouser like type of story, right? Um, big walled city states, you know, grand adventure, dark sorceresses, that kind of thing. Uh, nothing earth shattering about the setting, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but what's really cool about Swords Without Master is uh, are the mechanics. The mechanics are so. Uh, I don't think I've ever encountered anything like it. Like they're just incredibly unique. Um, so the mechanics of Swords Without Master are exclusively focused on imagery and tone and like creating like threads within your story, like creating a cohesive, uh, knitted together story, uh, particularly and w- with like a, v- with a heavy emphasis on like imagery and tone. Um, the, it is, does, the mechanics do not concern themselves with, what is my stat for dexterity? Right. Right. Like, like how fast can I run or, right. or, you know, or my hit points or like any, it's not, it's, and it's not, not, it's not even like, can I do things? Yeah. Like, Cause you yeah. succeed at everything. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. More or less. There's a little tiny caveat there, but you, you basically succeed at everything you do, <laughs> like, or anything you want to do. There's no, uh, there is no, there's no failure. It's just not that kind of game. It's all about, it's all about just like creating this story that rolls along with this sort of momentum, uh, you know, where, where it's like just these, these rogues, your, your rogue characters are having this grand adventure and they are getting into fights and they are finding, you know, they're discovering ancient secrets. You're getting a really cool heroic story. Um, the again, the game does not concern itself with like simulation is concerns of like success or distance or failure or any of those types of things. Right. So here's the deal. The, the principal mechanic of the game is, uh, these two dice. Uh, one is called the glum die and the other is called the, uh, jovial die. And these two dice represent like the tones with which whoever has the narrative control at the moment has to narrate their scene, right? So the GM kind of starts the scene by, by setting the overtone. Uh, you roll some dice and whichever one's higher becomes the overtone, either glum or jovial. Uh, and then the characters, like, the characters just essentially, like, whoever's got control of the narration, they just kind of say what they're doing, like, oh, I'm running through the, the tunnels, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting the bad guys, I'm doing this, I'm swinging my sword, I'm doing all that stuff. But you have to narrate it in, in accordance with the overtone, right? 
Right. Um, but then when you decide to do something decisive as a character, like when you want to decisively like take this guard out, right? Like you just, you're kind of just fighting the guard and describing that. And once you make the decision to say, okay, I want to take this guy out, you then roll the dice yourself and you have your own personal tone, either glum or jovial. And then you have to narrate killing the guard in that glum or jovial manner. So let's talk about <laughs> glum or jovial. I feel like I should, I feel like I should define glum yeah, or jovial right. for us. So, uh, glum means cold. Quiet, gloomy, dark, or ironic. Uh, jovial means warm, loud, joyous, bright, or mocking. So here's a good example of the two in action. You are, I've rolled the dice, I'm trying to kill this guard, and uh, I roll glum. So uh, the way I might narrate the glum is I take my dagger and I, I stick it right into his stomach and I, I, I rip his stomach open and his entrails fall out and they remind me of, uh, I don't know, this, like, they remind me of like the, the, some, foreboding uh constellation in the sky or whatever right you know, like, and that's that's how i kill the guy that's how i take him out that's my glum result right but if i roll jovial i might say how i'm sort of peter parker style like joking with the guard as i'm getting ready to take him out you know like oh like oh you're you know you're awfully slow or blah 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 or whatever joke 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 uh <laughs> you know, like, like you're mocking him or whatever you're making a kind of a fun thing and then boom you kill him right um that's the difference, right? And so the whole game is concerned with like alter these alternating like like moments of glumness as <laughs> or joviality, <laughs> right? Uh, even like when you're setting the scenes up, if you set the, so um, if the overtone is glum, the GM has to set has to set up set up the setting in a glum way. So. Uh, maybe they're in like a dark crypt, right? Or, or, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's dank and, uh, there's the sound of like sad music coming from a hallway or whatever, right? You describe like something that's just glum, <laughs> as it were. But if it's jovial, you might set the scene a little differently. You might describe how like there's sunlight coming in from the cracks of the roof and, uh, you can hear birds chirping outside the temple, right? Right. That kind of thing. So it's a, it's a really neat, um, the game has this really neat emphasis on, on those two like shifting tones. Um, there's a whole lot I could say about this game. I could probably go on forever about it. Well, so I think one of the interesting things when we played it was, when you are like when things are happening and the GM's describing what happens, he is supposed to be getting like making things worse and worse and worse for your characters. Mm. But there's like the safety valve of you always at any time you can be like, okay, now's where I start. To now's where I'm gonna start kicking ass, yeah. right? Yeah, and exactly. so like it kind of encourages you to wait it out and wait it out and like build the tension right, and all of yeah, that. And like yeah. as the player, you're you're sitting there like waiting for the tension to build to the level that you're like. Okay, well, this is, this is a cool part to like break. To and break actually it. Do yeah. Things. And do the cool yeah. shit. Yeah. Okay. No, I remember that was, yeah, they, they call it like the thunderstorms or whatever, right? right? right yeah. yeah. Right. I don't remember exactly how it goes, but yeah, like you're, the GM's always like constantly rolling in the thunder and then you eventually, right. you know, like, you know, uh, stop it or, or and you can to also, it. it doesn't have to be the person who the GM is doing horrible things to. They're not necessarily the person with the die. And right. so you can sit there and watch other people kind of get their asses kicked. Right. While yeah. you're holding the die <laughs> right, and just yeah. grinning the whole time. Yeah, exactly. Cause, cause until you give them the dice, they can't, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. they can't like react. They, 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 they can, they can't like definitively like, like decisively like resolve. Right. They the can conflict. resist, but they can't actually yeah. like yeah. stop whatever's happening. So the, uh, the one more thing I want to say about the game, which is really neat. Uh, again, going back to how the game is just very, very like, just focused on like certain types of storytelling. It essentially has these three things that are called threads. There's these three types of threads that you work into that can come into the game in different ways. There's mysteries, morals, and motifs. All right. Uh, mysteries happen. So normally when you're rolling your, your tone dice, if you, if you roll a tie, that means you're stymied in some way and the GM gets to narrate like how you're kind of like what you were trying to do is frustrated a little bit, right? Like there's, or there's some complication or twist. If you roll a one or if, if your ties are a one or a two, you get to have a mystery. And what the mystery is, is, not only do you like fail at what you were trying to do, but there's some supernatural reason why it happened. Right. Right. And there's some supernatural underlying reason why it took place. And so you write that on a card as like a mystery that needs to be solved. The other thread is called morals. Um, it's also triggered mechanically in some way. I don't remember how, but, um, but when a moral is triggered, your character does something, they take action, but uh, it has some sort of like unfortunate consequence, which results in like a moral lesson, right? Like, what did we learn? Right. Yeah. <laughs> what did we learn today? Right? <laughs> and you write that moral on the card and you put that on the table. And then the final thing is the motifs. Uh, the motifs are like a 
they're basically like the timekeeping uh, mechanism. Uh, there are three motifs, and each motif has is made up of three elements. And essentially, what you do is every time something cool comes up in the fiction or in the narration, like some cool imagery, usually it's usually like just like a cool image or like a or like an object or like a person. Whenever and if and any player at all can say, "Oh, I like that. I want to make that an element of this motif." And so you write that on the card. And once uh, once three motifs get three elements, that triggers the end game, right? Right. And the end game is like this one final round where every character tries to reincorporate the threads, right? So okay. you you are trying to, I may try to like reincorporate the mystery by like in my narration, like solving the mystery. Like well, here was what that supernatural thing was, right? right? Yeah. Or if I, or the moral, I may like narrate how my character has learned his lesson, right? right. Um, and then Which that, is fantastic. Like, yeah. Because it sets up like the perfect callback. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so good. Story. Yeah, it's really, yeah. really good. And the, and the one I really love, it's a little more subtle and complex, but the, the one I love is, uh, is when you reincorporate the motifs because in the, when you reincorporate the motifs, you take two of the elements. Remember, it has three. You take two of the elements and you combine them in some way right. um, at, at, to make sort of like a brand new element for that motif. So, like if uh, if you had like if one, uh, the, the, I think the example they give in the book is one of the elements is like a gold mask and the other element is like a gold statue. You can narrate how like oh I took this gold mask and I put it on and it caused me to have. Uh, the ability to like turn things to gold when I touched it, that kind of thing, right? So you've kind of incorporated like these two elements into into uh, uh, into a single thing, which is which is kind of neat. I love it. <laughs> like I've only played it once, and I want to play it more. Uh, but I, I really, really dig it um, because it focuses really laser. It's really laser focused on telling a certain type of story, and uh, and 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 really just like um, hammering home like good narration and fiction and imagery and and and, and like you said the callbacks and all that right, stuff yeah. like it's great uh, and, and and it concludes <laughs> like like the story, <laughs> yeah, the story yes. ends which is great really really love swords without master um, do you guys have anything you want to say about it or we can move on i think i'm good cool uh well then dan what's your third and final airbud so my last airbud um my ultimate airbud the I ultimate airbud oh my is- well, just in its, in its ordering. <laughs> this is the one that plays football, not just basketball. Right, yeah, right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Airbud 3. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great, Derek. <laughs> Thank you for coming out of the closet as a big Airbud fan. We love it. <laughs> so my third Airbud is Remember Tomorrow by Gregor Hutton. And so this is a cyberpunk game. Right. And it's kind of... I don't know, maybe it's kind of fiasco-like, but the general idea is that you are cyberpunk characters, and over the course of the game, like, you're you're creating this character and um, giving them sort of a mission, and they're trying to become ready, willing, and able to carry out these this mission. Right, And so, yeah. um, once those three boxes are kind of checked, then that character accomplishes his mission and exits the story. Right. And... That's kind of what the general goal is. But also during this, there's very weak ownership of the characters. So okay. you start by creating your character, but you don't necessarily have to keep like holding on to him through the whole game. You can always sort of throw him back and make a new character. Okay. Or you can pick up a character that somebody else is throwing back oh, and right. just start yeah. playing them. Yeah. Kind of like so, the final girl. Uh, sort of like that. It's yeah, a well, little, that's, what, that's what I thought of. Yeah, the there's girl, a little yeah. stronger ownership, though, because you're holding a character that no one else can play until it gets back around to you. Okay. okay. And that's important because when the play goes around the table, uh, it's not like the spotlight isn't being passed as like the, the player spotlight isn't being passed. It's the GM role that's being passed. And so when when it's like your turn, you're playing the GM. And so you choose another character to give a scene to. Okay. And so... Like, you'll pick another player, and whichever character they have set aside is who gets the scene. And so, um, you can either choose to have a scene with your character in it, but they kind of discourage that. And there's, like, you know, the central pool of characters that have been created, but there's also a pool of antagonists who all have their own agendas that they're trying to accomplish. So you're kind of encouraged to use characters who aren't your own to try to, like, uh, push the other character, the other player cars- players' characters to whatever their goal is. But, uh, by doing that, you're always sort of advancing the goals of the characters in the pool or the antagonists in the pool. And so what it does is like, you're kind of picking up threads of all these people's stories, like the people or corporations or rogue AIs or whoever right, the antagonists yeah. are. Like they've all got their own goals. And when you're the GM, you're kind of pushing their goal against another player's goal. Right. And so it really does a, 
amazing job of kind of filling out the world because you have all of these plot threads. Like every antagonist has their own plot thread going. Right. Every character has their own plot thread. And you're kind of picking the ones that seem interesting and like pushing those. But the whole world is really well realized and kind of alive because in the background, there's all these other things happening. And at any point, you can kind of zoom down onto any one that you want and like play that one out. So, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Derek. So it, it, it's kind of you, well, you, you already basically said this, but you're, you're building the world through each individual character. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so like sort of by defining what they're all about. That's like filling in another section of the there's, world. There's there's right? no like there's no like world building that goes on per no, se. No, there's not really per se yeah. world building, right? No, you're kind of dumped into like this is this is a cyberpunk world. Go go. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. it, it, it's almost like painting a negative space because you don't set up the whole world beforehand and throw the characters into it. Right. You build the characters and then discover the world right, through right, those characters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a much more eloquent way of saying what I was trying to say. So. <laughs> I, I love it. I mean, I I think it's really cool. The just that conceptually, I think it's really neat. Question: I uh, we've played it once, or I played it once. I don't know if you, you may have played it more, Dan, but I've only played it once. Um, I remember a couple of things stuck out to me from our play from our play of it, and one was we had a lot of players and. The sheer number of antagonists and central characters got to be a little overwhelming. Um, do you think that would be an issue with a smaller number or was it just like the fact that we had so many people? I don't know. I didn't think it was overwhelming at all. Oh, I did. Actually, I'm, I'm, I thought I'm simple. it was great. I'm real simple. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I felt a little overwhelmed. I felt there like, were oh, a my couple gosh. players. There were a couple characters who kind of just got introduced and nothing happened to them. Yeah, but that's yeah. because nobody thought they were interesting, oh, that's so we true. just didn't. You just kind of ditch them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. So it's kind of like self-correcting, I guess. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hmm, that's interesting. Cool. It's like Sonder. All of these characters have their own lives. But, yeah. Oh, the some obscure of them barely see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Podcast callback episode right. episode five callback. I love it. That's good. Uh, well, that leaves the final one on your list, Derek. What is it? So the final one for my list is uh, Siren, which I believe has mm. been mentioned here Love before. Love Siren, yeah, yeah. It's great. fantastic game. This is my sci-fi pick. Mm-hmm. Um, it's by Meg Baker, and the main reason I pick it is the mechanics, which, I, like I said, has you, you've already kind of talked about, but I'll give a brief overview here with. Oh yeah, no, um, go for it. Yeah. Well, and it was an it was an episode zero, which according to the downloads, no one's listened to really. So, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> so go for it. Yeah, like episode, that was the episode where we just pounded on the table and like <laughs> breathed heavily right, in the microphones yeah, for right, an hour yeah. and so. said um 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 <laughs> yeah. um. <laughs> Sounded like a Gregorian <laughs> yeah. chant going on. Right, right, yeah. 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 The com- the main top actually for anybody listening, the main topic discussion in episode zero is so good. It is really really good, but it's sad that like it's wrapped up in this like. Like, uh, learning exercise. Right, yeah. right, yeah. It's unfortunate that it sounds like we recorded it like in a dive bar on right, iPhone. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really bad. Uh, so, no, by all means, like recap the, the mechanics because there's a good chance no one's no one's heard that part of that podcast. So, so um, a, a big thing with Siren is something that again we've been talking about all this podcast is kind of giving up your character agency right. um, and your ownership of the character. And so at the very beginning of this game, you write several questions right. uh, about your character. And these are questions... Well, the, the whole idea of Siren is you wake up at the site of a car crash and you have crazy psychic powers and someone's chasing you. And you have amnesia. And important. you have amnesia. Right, yeah. That you, you wake up at that car wreck crash and that's all you remember. It's a crash of some sort. It yeah. can be any kind of crash. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. And so you, you write these series of questions and these questions can be like, why do I have a receipt from 7-Eleven in my pocket right. to, you know, why, you know, something more, you know, something deeper, like why do I have flashes of, um, some love emotion whenever I see the color blue or something right, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the whole point of the game is to answer these questions. Right. And the way you answer these questions is, uh, while you're running around, uh, the GM will occasionally have you make a roll and you build this dice pool, uh, based on whether you're using your side power. I can't remember what the other options uh, yeah, are. So I think it's like um, you. So so in the game, just to back up a little bit, yeah. you're being your characters are being chased by these these guys called the chasers, and they can right. be anything. They can be like government agents or aliens or whatever, whatever the GM wants, right? And um, whenever you whenever whenever there's something that like you could possibly fail at or whatever, you you do or you're taking a risk, you roll those dice. And I think you um, if you're using your psi power, you get a die for your pool. If you because uh, and and what that means is. 
um, you're risking that your psi power might go wild, right? Right. And like destroy some shit, right? Or hurt you. Um, and I think you also get dice based off like, um, uh, if there's a chance you could get hurt doing the thing you're trying to do, uh, you, you if, get a die. You get a die. There's, uh, there's several different things. Yeah. But, but anyway, you, you build this pool and then you roll the dice. And the really interesting thing with it is each die that you roll has to be assigned to a specific place on this grid of outcomes. Right. And so your outcomes are uh, whether your goal is achieved, right. whether the chasers catch up to you, uh, whether you're captured, whether you take damage, whether your psi power loses, whether you lose control of your psi power. If you tapped it. If right. you tapped it, right. And so you assign these dice, and then depending on how well you rolled on each individual die, tells you how you did on that specific category. Right. So if you, uh, this uses D6s. So if you roll a six on your goal, you achieved your goal. But if you rolled a one on your psi power and you were using your psi power, it, the psi power goes, hey, why are you just level like three city blocks or right. something yeah. like that? Yeah. And so it, it's this really interesting game like meta game where you're you're trying to decide what what can I give up but what what what's really important to right. me as a character yeah, yeah exactly um so it it does unfortunately kind of pull you out of the story it, for a it little does bit. have that problem yeah that's a tiny bit you're right but but I would argue that it does it in a way that kind of engenders character development because you're thinking what is really important to my character right is it really important that i don't hurt innocence or is it really important that i don't get captured or that i trigger a memory or that i trigger a memory and that's another key thing in this game because the game keeps going until at least one one character has answered all of their questions right yeah um, and then the really cool thing about these answering of questions is that you never get to answer you don't your get own to question. answer them yeah someone else gets to it's yeah. always someone else right um and so that that's really cool because you have to give up that character agency right. a little bit and you can't just be like no my guy would never do that right no. yeah right. That yeah. Is, yeah which is ooh 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 ooh, ooh. Side note, uh, uh, PSA, <laughs> if you are a role player and you have ever said the phrase, my character wouldn't do that, slap your own hand because that, that, <laughs> that is bad. Like, don't ever do that. Don't ever, don't ever do that again. That just makes you insufferable. All right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> don't ever say my character wouldn't do that. Been, when, when someone is giving you, an, when someone is giving you an amazing, cool, fictional option or a thing to do and you say, my character wouldn't do that. Uh, get out. GTFO. Sorry. <laughs> that said, if someone's giving you a really dumb option. Well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Try another way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that, that's why we have the ritual phrases. I, I love, uh, we talked about this in episode zero, but I love that memory revealing thing. It is so damn cool. It is. Um, it, it is uh, getting back to this idea of like feeling like you are as a player are solving a mystery. It knocks it right out of the park. Like it really does because, because the question, the answer to the question is always something, it's, it's something you never anticipated because it comes from another player. Right. And oftentimes what the really fun thing that's going on is as you're answering those questions, you sort of naturally start to tie them all together to create like this sort of like backstory narrative, right? Why and, all the characters are together. Right. right and exactly. All that stuff. All that yeah. stuff. It's really cool. Like in our game, um, the, the one game that we always call back to, even though we, <laughs> we played it several times, but the one we always call back to is, um, it turned out like the chasers were after us because we were like terrorists. And right. so they had to catch us because once our memories flooded back, we were going to go blow up a building or whatever, right? With our crazy psi powers. So, and it was really badass. It was just so, so cool. Um, uh, another little nice thing about Siren is it solves uh, a dual problem. It is both a very good supers game yes. and a very good investigation game in of a sense or a mystery game, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, really good at both of those things. And, uh, Siren's awesome. Um, um the, the last thing I want to bring up with this is something that Siren does. Another game called Ocean does this too. Right. Is yeah. this whole idea of this index card map. Which is oh fantastic. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that's where you're going to go with the comparison. That, oh that yeah, because yeah. <laughs> yeah. they because they, they they match up in a lot of ways. Yeah, there, there are yeah. other aspects yeah. of Ocean that tie into this, right. but yeah. um, Cyrun in general is the superior game, uh, except for maybe this index card map. I think Ocean does a little it's, it's, bit it's better. Fun. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's this idea of this abstract map. So it's not like you know your grid paper drawing out all the right angles right, and everything. Yeah, yeah. But it's just you know you start out at your crash site, and then from there you move to a tenement building, and from there you move to Tulsa mall or, or whatever, yeah, right, or whatever. Right, yeah. 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 And, Seattle, where and, we go and and start. Jack in the decks or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> what do you do in Seattle? I don't know. <laughs> it involves Native Americans and orcs. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Keep going. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
it, it leaves of or it makes a very good visual representation of where your characters have been, where they're going, places that can be reincorporated and you can revisit again, all these just great locations. And then also one of the aspects that uh, one, one of the elements that you can put a die in is whether the chasers catch up to you right, or not. Yeah. So it also tracks where the chasers, the chasers are. are at. Yeah. It's yeah. So one of the things uh, I, I, you're right that I love about Siren that I never really thought of before is that visual aid it, that like it abstracts, you know, um, all these locations and stuff, but still gives like a visual thing that the players can look at on the table and know where everything is. I'm sorry. I'm just rephrasing what you just said, but, but, uh, but I, I it is very cool. I, and, and now that I think about it, I wish more games did that. A lot of games could do that. You could just, you could just make an index card map. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it's the best part of motion. But, but if it, I mean, I think if the game is not focused on moving through well, space, true. it no, doesn't that's, well, make a whole lot enough. of sense necessarily. No, no, that's fair. No, that's well, fair. It would work great for Dungeon World, though. Oh, uh, yeah. And would, a lot, yeah. lot of those dungeon crawl where who cares about crawling down the hallway and specific, checking for the traps? Specifics. Right. Yeah. Um, here's we've been, the temple. A lot of people the, care about <laughs> walking down the hallway and checking for traps, it turns out. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, so, uh, uh, Torchbearer. A, an, another fine Luke Crane product. Um, Torchbearer, I've never played it. It's a beautiful book though. Does that exact thing. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you don't, you have like a cartographer. Someone is the cartographer in the group. And you, instead of like drawing a map, you just draw like a, a, a list of locations, right? Like in, in whatever abstract or, or specific way that you, you want to, to identify them. And as long as they're on that list, uh, and you can make it index cards if you wanted, as long as you can always return to it. Right. right. So, which is kind of and, and if it's so important that you have hallways that you can crawl down and check for traps, you can just have an index card that says hallways. hallways right. right. Yeah, exactly. Connects to everything. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Done. Cool. Uh, yeah. Siren's awesome. Love Siren. So my final game, my final air bud is, uh, it's my science fiction game as well. Uh, call, it is called Mars Colony. Um, it is by Tim Kopeng. Uh, it, uh, it's been out for, Several years now, I think. Uh, there's a, there's yeah. a sequel now too called Mars Colony 39 Dark, uh, uh, which I have, but I have not looked at yet. Um, it is unique in a lot of ways. Uh, one way in which it's unique or not unique, but, but certainly unusual is that it's a two player role playing game. That's a very rare thing. Right. <laughs> you, there are not very many like role playing games that are specifically and only for two people, right? Right. Uh, and in Mars Colony, uh, the way that plays out is you have one character who is kind of like the GM character, uh, and then you have the other, or what, or the, the GM's, you know, what sort of player he handles like the world and everything around the protagonist. The other player plays just the, the, the main character of the story. And the story is, um, this is another way the game is kind of unique. I think that this, the, the story is quite unique. Again, I don't read. This may not be a unique thing. <laughs> this may not be unique in the genre, but for me, it seems really, really mind blowingly unique. Um, is your your character is like this um so do you remember uh like when Iraq was going on and there would always be like this civilian administrator over 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 like Baghdad or whatever from from the United States you know like while right. we had like the right. green, the green yeah. zone and all right. that right it's kind of a similar role like you were being sent in from earth uh, to monitor this colony on Mars that is falling apart, right? Uh, so you're sent there. Uh, the people that are sending you are like a, 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 a consortium of like governments, uh, on Earth, as well as like corporations and things like that. So you have, you have a number of masters that you are serving, but you are like the one person they're sending to like go in there and like you're an administrator and you're going in there to try to fix all the problems. So the colony, when you arrive, has like three or four, I think it's three, um, like, basic like problems that are threatening to destroy the colony right and it's always things like um oh there are cracks in the in the oxygen dome or whatever or the the environmental dome or uh there's a labor riot you know over at the you know over at the 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 the, the pleasure hotel or whatever the pleasure hotel what is that that's not what i meant <laughs> Sorry. I, I was i was confused i was not drawing the right word uh like so the colony is supposed to be kind of like a, a tourist destination or like a you know retirement thing and so uh maybe there's like a problem with like the the people who are there to work right uh maybe there's a problem with like the water or the, or whatever right you've got these three issues and so what you're doing is with the gm you're telling the story of this guy who is trying to come up with uh uh, solutions to these problems. There are scenes where you can be presented with like various issues popping up. Like maybe there's like a bad news story and you have to kind of deal with that. Or, um, you know, maybe you've got like, you're getting like more specific detail about like, like this, the specific problem, you know, and, and, and various like actors that you need to deal with. Or you can have scenes that are more of a personal, na- more of a personal nature. There's always one NPC in the setting that is like, 
their only connection to the story is your is the main guy. Like they're usually like a love interest or like a family member or something. And so you can have scenes like kind of showing the tension with that character. But ultimately what you're trying to do as the player is you have to come up with plans for solving these these colony problems. And you do so once you once you've come up with a plan, you then engage in a die mechanic that is uh, it's a push your luck die mechanic. So you roll two dice and uh, it's a difficulty thing where I think it's like each problem has like a score of 40 or something like that. And you roll two dice and, and you just subtract the amount from it. And every, and every roll you decide to take, you could just keep subtracting more and more until you roll a one. Uh, you can stop whenever you want, but if you, ro- but if you keep going and you roll a one, um, then you lose all your progress and nothing happens and you, and you, and you get a little setback. Um, and you're perceived as, you know, like, like there's you know, a certain part of the population who perceives you as kind of like, you know, not, not good. And so you have to deal with that. But here's a really cool thing. Uh, it's a game about politics and it's a, it's, it's a commentary on politics and it's a commentary on, um, on the things that politicians do to like burnish their reputation. And, um, so your guy is always thinking about like how he's going to be perceived when he gets back home. Like, was he a success or was he not a success in fixing the colony? So right. if you blow the roll, you can choose to lie. <laughs> you can, you can choose to make up like a deception whereby your plan appears to have worked, but for some reason, which you narrate what it is, for some reason, it did not actually work, but it, it looks like it worked. <laughs> but doing that is its own push your luck thing, because the more you do that, the more you like use deception, uh, the greater the risk of triggering this, this mechanical outcome whereby you are like shamed and revealed to be a fraud, right? And you have to go back home with your head, you know, hung low, right? right. So it's really, really neat. Um, it tells a story that I don't think you get normally in a sci-fi role-playing game. You don't usually get this story about like politics and bureaucracy. That's right. Not, that's not yeah. usually the story that gets told. Um, and it, and I think the mechanic is really cool too. Um, the, this like, um, dual push your luck mechanic where like you're, you're trying to take care of the problem. You're, you're going in it with, you're going into it with like earnest good intentions and, but when you, but when it doesn't work, when your plan doesn't work, you, you know, you, <laughs> you like, you, you fudge some paperwork or you like cause somebody to disappear or whatever. You create some sort of deception that look, makes it look like you did great, right? Uh, but that's, you know, but you're, but you're pushing it when you do that and risking and risking ruin and, and shame. Um, really, really cool. Uh, I, I, I dig it. It's, um, for anybody listening, it's a, it's a great easy game to get to the table. So if you've got just like you and your wife or you and your spouse, um, uh, or partner, and you want to play a role playing game, this is a terrific way of getting people involved in role playing because everyone understands politics. Everyone understands like all the metaphors of the game, right? Like the, the, right. the game is like very plainly a metaphor on like, you know, political organizations and, and activism and stuff like that and, and bureaucracy. And so I don't know. I, I just, it's, it's a good, good, um, like kind of introductory role playing or at least story game, you know, for people who don't, are not really into them. And because it's just you and the other person, you can kind of gently like, like get them into it without, right, yeah. without the p- social pressure of having a lot of people <laughs> around the table. Right? right. So, um, so yeah. Uh, so that's my final game, Mars Colony. You guys have any, anything? Are these things that happen? Are you like rolling to figure out what happens? Or as the GM, are you just deciding what's going on? No, so you have, um, uh, it's been a little bit since I've played it, but as I recall, you have like a list by which you each get to choose an element, essentially. Like, okay. like maybe you choose two and I choose one or, or whatever. Or we choose two each. I don't remember what the exact number is, but you just have like a little list of like potential problems. You just choose. And okay. then, um, you each, like before the game, you kind of make up like, you do this little exercise where you each write three you fill out three index cards that are like things about like real world modern day politics that you don't like, right? Like, Oh, that's great. I love games. That that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you fill out like the, so like you might say like, Oh, um, I, I, I hate it because I, f- I feel like there's too much, uh, there's too much money in politics, right? Right. Or, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Or, um, I don't like it, but I don't like states where the judges are elected, right? Like you write like whatever the thing is that, that bothers you about politics in the real world. And then you put those in a little stack, you mix them up and you can draw them whenever you want. They have no mechanical function, no strict mechanical function. You just draw them if you just need inspiration. Okay. And, and it works pretty well. Like you, like, you know, if you're just kind of stuck for like where you want to take the story, you kind of draw one of those and, and it kind of gives you some information. And you also have like this, you have like this set of like kind of pre-done NPCs that cover certain factions within the colony, like the news media, right, uh, the yeah. legislature, like that, that kind of thing. And those are kind of like pre-done. They all have names and everything. Uh, and you, you make a couple of decisions about their like sort of political allegiances, but otherwise they're, you know, they're just, they're just like NPCs for the, for the, for the GM player to, to throw in there and use. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. 
Uh, the setup's super fast. I think like you can get the game going in like 30 minutes tops, probably not even that, like maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, but it's great. No, it's really good. Mars Colony. Awesome. Great. Cool. Well, so that was the Gauntlet podcast. Uh, the, the, the stupidly named Air Buds <laughs> of role playing and sci fi games, fantasy and sci fi role playing games. Um, whatever. <laughs> we thought of that like literally one minute before we hit record. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, that, that was our, that was our, that was our podcast. Uh, if you would like to, uh, reach us, we can be reached, uh, via Gmail at gauntletpodcast at gmail.com. We have a, a vibrant website, uh, called, oh shit, gauntletpodcast.libsyn.com. Yes. There it is. Yes. Got it. Nailed and, uh, we are also on Meetup. So if you're going to be in Houston four or five months from now, you can, uh, find us on Meetup and, uh, and join a game. And then we are also on Google Plus, which is kind of our main hangout where we, where we talk about, you know, role playing games. We continue the conversation as it were. You just go to G Plus communities and search for the gauntlet and we pop right up. Thanks for joining us, Derek. Thank you very much. And, uh, thanks, Dan. Thank you. Cool. Uh, have a good one. Bye.